me, Coco, and she heard they them pronouns. And again, I'm Associate Program Director uh, of Training and Education at True Colors United. Um, training and education primarily works uh, in training and also education. So we develop resources, toolkits, courses, you name it, and also do trainings around the country within the US um, and uh, really abroad. So um, these are best practices that we've developed not only uh, as a team internally, but also with the health guidance and expertise of young people that we work alongside with. Um, we have a really wonderful group of 25 young people um, that make up the National Youth Forum on Homelessness. Um, they impact federal policy, state policy, and local policy, and all work within their communities, um, almost like a national youth uh, advisory or action board. So, very cool, they're very radical, great group of uh, young people that I'm very lucky to work with. Um, so, we must. <laughs> Some people might have seen this before. This is something that I think in order to understand anything about working with LGBTIQ young people, um, young people who are experiencing housing instability or homelessness, um, anyone that interacts with another human being on a daily basis should have a foundational understanding of oppression, um, what it is, how it functions within society. Uh, and so I have a very unique task of uh, providing what could be a PhD program in about five minutes. And so buckle up. <laughs> oh. what is this? Okay. Um, so the working definition of oppression that I use is very simple. It's to the point. It's like four words. Um, we consider it to be an unjust use of power. Um, and so in order for oppression to exist, uh, there must be power. There must be a power imbalance. And that power must be exerted uh, over another being entity group. Good with that definition? Anyone want to add anything to it? Amazing. <laughs> great, great. Um, and so this is what we call the four eyes of oppression. Um, so when we think about oppression in the way that it functions within society, there are four main levels um, in which it operates. Um, the first is the big idea. So it's whatever drives oppression within a society. So it's that ideological form of oppression. Um, so if we're thinking about white supremacy, um, and then white supremacy here is an ideological form of oppression. It's a way to exert control and power over uh, people of color, over black people, indigenous people, um, for the purposes of colonization and basically a power and control. Um, it is also, if we're talking about LGBTIQ folks, um, it can be considered heterosexism. So that's the driving force societally that uh, informs all of our systems, our interactions, our policies, and our experiences. Um, so heterosexism, this definition we have, um, is a system of belief that heterosexual identities are more valued. Um, it's not really a belief that they are, it's the fact that they are more valued within society um, and, uh, and therefore are more powerful um, the norm and the more mainstream. Audre Lorde, she gets it. Uh, she says that it's also the uh, inherent superiority of one way of loving over another. So it comes back to that idea of dominance and superiority. Cisgenderism, on the other hand, is uh, the inherent belief and notion and act of, uh, of cisgender people being the mainstream of the norm, exerting power of trans folks, um, ensuring that they maintain that control and power by any means possible. On an institutional level, um, so we have the ideological level, right? So we have heterosexism and cisgenderism. Um, that big idea that feeds directly into our institutions. So that feeds into our governments, our laws, our policies. Um, one example I come to a lot would be any sort of like bathroom access rule, locker rooms, things like that we have um, at, at that level of legal you know, rights to access in certain spaces. Um, within homelessness services, shelters, that could be um, housed based on your uh, sex rather than your gender identity. Anything that ensures that you know, you're not given the same access that you would like um, 
compared to your heterosexual or cisgender peers. On an interpersonal level, heterosexism and cisgenderism function as homophobia and transphobia. So, you know, those two things can either, you know, be really overt, like aggressive actions towards another person, um, but they can also be really covert in these microaggression sort of ways um, that aren't intended to cause any discomfort or pain or what have you, but end up doing because they're ill informed and um, not operating from an equitable lens. So this is a good example of this. Anybody ever heard of One Direction? Um, so this is, uh, I think, a really good example of a um, microaggression or something that's really, you know, harmless on paper. Asking a young child, a young boy in this case, are you into girls yet? Do you like girls yet? These are the messages that we're getting at very young ages um, that let us know what is expected of us, what is normal, what is right, and then, therefore, what is also wrong and abnormal. And then finally, we have the way that all of these messages from an ideological, institutional, and interpersonal you know, functionality interfere with our ability to see ourselves, love ourselves, what have you. Um, what's wrong? So this is, um, you know, this can be, you know, any sort of internalized homophobia or you know, self-hate or not trusting yourself or not believing in yourself or not exerting any sort of um, power or autonomy within your own situations. Um, again, we're familiar. Um, and like I said, both of these at an interpersonal and internal level um, can occur uh, a spectrum of behaviors, conscious, unconscious behaviors, um, that can be anything from violent um, to microaggressions to, you know, uh, misgendering to, you know, you name it, um, but always, aren't always coming from a place of hate. Sometimes it's just a place of pure ignorance. Um, so yeah, again, you see at the top here, heterosexism and cisgenderism, homophobia and transphobia. And when we're thinking about our systems, the way they're set up, uh, they're operating under these ideological principles. So everything was set up with the needs of the mainstream mind, which would be cisgender folks and uh, heterosexual folks. Um, and so anyone else that is accessing these systems aren't accessing the system that was intended for them by design. Um, you know, that wasn't an intentional thing that was built in, but it's now an unintended consequence of our systems. I would also say, you can see how these feed into one another. Um, you know, these internalized feelings can lead into, uh, you know, interactions that are really charged um, really frustrated, really blocked, you know, kind of leading to young people not feeling like they can be their authentic selves in relation to another person, to someone that's staff or an adult or what have you. And so all of these things kind of impact each other one way or another, some more uh, significantly, but they all play in relation. Um, if we're talking about housing, you know, we still get some ideological, institutional, interpersonal, internal systems. So this is what I really like. This is a housing ready approach, ideological, you know, way of mind. So this is the idea that housing first doesn't work for everybody. People need to be ready for housing before they can access housing. So that's that ideological, institutional level. What that leads to is uh, service providers or whoever's working at the shelter um, believing and saying and projecting that before someone can have housing, we need to know that they're responsible. They need to prove it to us, right? Um, and then for young people that are accessing services, this leads to an idea that maybe I'm not ready for housing. Maybe it is way too much for me. Maybe when I get there, I'll be overwhelmed and I won't have all the tools. And um, so it can be a very, very, very harmful approach. Housing first, rather, um, says everyone has a right to housing because housing is a human right. Um, and then young people believe and know that to be true, that they deserve housing, they have a right as anyone else has to access housing. Any questions on these four eyes? Cool. So, you know, the reason we talk about that is because we are working with young people. Honestly, who, I'm, I'm wondering who's in the audience in terms of like, <laughs> work background? Like, are folks from LGBTQ advocacy, from housing? If you're from housing, if you work in housing services, amazing. 
Um, and if you, I would assume that people <laughs> <laughs> I have a master's degree, so uh, <laughs> right? pretty obvious. Um, so yes, yeah, so anybody that's asking, accessing services, anyone that we're working with or interacting with on a daily basis is an intersectional human being. They're a person that carries many identities, multiple identities. Um, you can't turn them on or turn them off. Um, it is who you are as a full holistic being. And so we need to be aware of that when we're speaking to anyone. You know, no one is a one-dimensional character. Um, and so when we're thinking about intersectionality within our systems, you know, somebody that's coming in to access housing, um, if they are queer or trans or both, if they come from a background um, of different ability, if they have uh, you know, a family history um, of violence, or if they suffer from any mental illness, these are all things that we need to be aware of um, in order to ensure that we're meeting their needs and meeting them exactly where they're at. So these are just a couple examples. There are probably 8,000 plus different intersectional identities and you know, thing to be considered, but it's really important and it's a major, major best practice in terms of any sort of uh, supportive service that's being provided. So again, it, you know, we are like way behind in terms of um, intersex population and visibility and data. Um, so all of our resources have been built with LGBTQ folks in mind. In mind. Um, so I do feel like I have to keep that acronym because they weren't created with intersex folks in mind. Um, it's a huge deficit on our end. It's something that we're very committed to working on. Um, this is a question that we get all the time, and I'm sure maybe other people do as well. Why do you focus on LGBTQ youth? Seems a little bit exclusive, doesn't seem super uh, you know, equitable, and you're not really capturing everyone. We want everybody to be stably housed and supported and loved and affirmed. Um, but as we've been saying, and Gregory mentioned earlier, you know, we, we not only believe, but we truly know that when you meet the needs of the most marginalized, the most impacted young people, you are meeting everyone's needs. And so, yeah, that's really the way that we think about the work that we do and the importance of the work that we all do. In terms of like drivers to homelessness, and this kind of comes back into, you know, thinking about intersectionality, you know, the, the majority of young people that have reported or have given us um, their very, very valuable data about how they've ended up experiencing housing instability. The majority of them um, experience family rejection or kicked out of course out of their homes. Um, I would say that if you asked any random person on the street, that's what they would tell you is the reason that LGBTIQ young people experience homelessness, right? So I, that feels like the most accessible reason. Um, and I think a lot of programs are, or a lot of, um, uh, outreach and things like that are, are operating with that in mind. And that's really important because obviously it makes up the majority. But there are a lot of other reasons that young people, LGBTIQ young people, are experiencing housing instability and homelessness, experiencing it for longer periods of time compared to their straight cis peers, experience it more frequently. There are a lot of other reasons. And if we're not focusing on those reasons, then we're not effectively ending the homelessness, right? So we have everything up here from uh, family poverty to incarcerated parents, um, abuse at home, uh, you know, family experiencing housing instability as a human. Um, there are a million different reasons. And it's important when working with LGBTIQ young people that we don't make an assumption that they have a contentious or a negative relationship with their family because oftentimes that's not true. Um, they might have a great family structure and not be able to live with their family for whatever reason. So not making that assumption is very important. This is a quote from a really good report that came out in 2018. Um, it just highlights literally what I just said, um, that family space broader issues, um, poverty, racism within housing, loss, violence, addiction, mental health, whatever it is, there are a broad, broad spectrum of reasons that people experience housing instability. Um, in terms of duration of homelessness, like I said, and Robbie mentioned earlier, on the left, the pink is for people who experience housing instability for longer periods of time. So obviously LGBTQ youth um, separate out from trans youth experience it uh, for longer periods of time compared to their sister peers. Trans young people experience it uh, for much longer periods of time. The little orange slice, I think it is, did I say blurry? Oh, yeah, the orange slice is shorter periods of time. So very rarely 
LGBTQ youth experience housing instability uh, for shorter periods of time compared to cis straight peers. You can see trans youth literally never kill. It's never, ever shorter. Sometimes it's the same or comparable, but it is mostly longer periods. And that's really important because that means they're going to be showing up in our systems for longer periods of time, but also repeatedly, and that it, we have a very unique responsibility to meet their needs and make sure that they're safe. Um, in the U.S. also, we have um, incredible disparity that comes down to black young people compared to white young people. Um, black young people experience housing instability at a rate that's more than double uh, their white counterparts. Um, and LGBTQ, LGBTQ, black young people experience it uh, more than double their white LGBTQ counterparts. So that's a huge racial disparity. Our country is predominantly white. Um, so infer that there's a lot going on within our systems that is also not meeting their needs. And this just kind of highlights uh, for trans young people and adults. So trans adults um, experience homelessness. 30% uh, of trans uh, adults experience homelessness um, at least once in their lifetime, and one in eight have experienced it in the last year. So, everyone feeling good? <laughs> These are lighthearted statistics. Um, so with all that in mind, right, so we are considering the fact that uh, the majority of young people that do experience housing instability and homelessness that identify as LGBTIQ are experiencing it because of family rejection, which is important to, you know, acknowledge. Um, and if they are now accessing our systems that are not set up to meet their needs, it's our responsibility to ensure that they are seen, loved, able to live authentically as their full Blessing selves. And so here are like a few ideas you know, that I've thrown out there um, of ways. And I don't think anything will be a surprise here. It's pretty, you know, hip group here. Um, but these are just like what we are have as tried and true best practice for ensuring that young people are safe and supported when they come through the doors. The first is front house. It's one of the, I would say it's like one of the easiest ways to ensure that you're valuing someone on some level, is to use the correct pronoun. Um, pronouns are how we refer to people in third person. So in English, we have um, pronouns such as she, her, he, him, they, uh, they them, it's easier. Um, the list goes on. Some people use their name, some people um, have other words. There's, we used to have this slide that was like every pronoun we had collected. People did not like that. Yeah, it was very overwhelming. So I'm just going to cut it down to those four. Those are the top four that I see um, showing up day to day. Um, are they important? They're absolutely, a spoiler, they're so important, they're like one of the most important things that you can do to validate somebody. Um, it is extremely important. And so I'm wondering, how do people think that you find out what someone's pronouns are? I see a lot of hands, so that's hard to choose. <laughs> Just one. Matea, how do you... How do you know what someone's pronouns are? Well, you just make the box. Just ask. You just gotta ask. If you don't ask, you'll never know. Unless they tell you. <laughs> so that's you know not really words to live by. But if you if you don't ask, if they do not tell you, you do not know what their pronouns are. Just get that in your mind. You do not know. Um, you know, I I would say that asking for some people is uncomfortable if you're not used to it, if you're not familiar with it. That's okay. It's not something everyone grew up doing. I didn't grow up asking people what their pronouns were, and at a certain point, I started, right? And the best way to get comfortable with it is to practice. Um, so something I recommend all the time is to never practice on your clients. Clients, they, they, you should be a pro by the time you ask your clients anything personal about them. You should not be you know, blushing or nervous or anything. You should be just confident to ask someone their pronouns. Because we're asking them a lot of personal stuff, typically. A lot of personal stuff, traumatic stuff, hard stuff. Um, so asking their pronouns should be a piece of cake, honestly. Um, and not only that, but don't just ask the people that you aren't sure of what their pronouns are. So if you see someone you're like, oh, I don't know, okay, but I know, I remember Coco said, I gotta ask, so I'll ask this person. You should ask every single person that comes through your doors what pronouns they use. Because again, it doesn't matter how they present, it doesn't matter what you assume, if you do not ask, and they do not tell you, you do not know. 
Um, a great way to ask someone their pronouns if you're not comfortable, um, especially in like an intake moment, I always say like to model that interaction, model that behavior. So you can say, um, my name is Coco, and she, her, they, them pronouns. Um, I'm wondering what name you'd like me to call you and what pronouns you use. I think we can all do that now. It's not, not so hard. Um, some people won't know what you're talking about. They might not be familiar. Some people might get mad. They'll say, isn't it obvious? Don't you, can't you tell? You say, I ask everybody what their pronouns are. If they don't know what they are, you can say, well, like I use she, her, they, them. You could use he, she, they, something else, whatever feels comfortable to be referred by. Um, if you mess up someone's pronouns, just say you're sorry and move on. Keep it moving. Don't say it's so hard for me. Don't say I'm new to this. Don't say it. Just sorry. Keep it moving. Good? Any questions about pronouns, asking, not asking, how to ask, when to ask, why to ask? Yeah, I have a question. So I'm from New Pinehurst, um, and I mean, like, our colleagues would uh, ask, I mean, you would have the base, why is this necessary? You know? Um, and what would be your, like, simple answer that people would kind of accept? Why it's necessary to ask someone their pronouns. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Using the correct pronoun for someone very simply like validates their identity. So it's very similar to using the correct name for someone. Um, I think they go, I think it's the same level of importance. Um, when someone tells you that they are uncomfortable to be referred to by she, her, which is basically what they're telling you if they're saying I use uh, he, him pronouns, for example. To then use she, her anyways is very invalidating. Um, it's, Frank, it's rude, you know, um, and it can cause someone to feel like they're not being respected at all um, and not being seen or heard. So I would say like on a very basic level, um, it just conveys respect and support. And I think maybe one argument that helps a little bit with straight people <laughs> is that, okay, yeah, I know that maybe only every tenth person will be affected by this, but we want to grow a different mindset here, you know? So maybe it's just kind of like <laughs> educating and spreading this idea. I don't know. It's just something that I find. Is it possible that in the future all of us will be just, I'm not saying just an era, but I'm no, she, hers, era. That it will be something like hello. Yeah. 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 All in the environment. Everyone uses pronouns. Every person in this room uses pronouns. Yeah. Every person in this room has a gender identity, congrats. Every person has sexual orientation. These are all things that we all have. It's not unique to LGBTIQ people. Um, and so I think it is going to become really mainstream um, in, a, in a much more broader way. Like in the U.S., every school, every university, you know, you first day of class, you see your name and pronouns. Um, it's just, it's very normal. Um, there are people that are resistant to it, but... Yeah, because I'm taller. I, 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 I wear, I have my hair short. Many times, even when I was pregnant, I was here. Yeah. Okay, it happened. But... Yeah, and you know, I mean, same. So I mean, like when I was getting vaccinated, I was still here like one time. <laughs> yeah. I just shoot it in the air. But um, you know, if you think about, it, I think the best way for people understand the importance of pronouns is to use like to have them either reflect on a time that the wrong one's been used on them, or think about how that feels. And for me, it's like I when I think about how it feels, I'm just like just. Just sucks, you know, like it just you feel just totally outside of yourself and kind of throws you, right? At, at the very micro, micro, micro emotional aspect. Because when you're hot, when you're younger, it hurts. Yeah, it does. Especially as a teen. Yeah. So I think it's a it's a, it's something that we can all relate to and um, you know, for people that don't understand or are resistant to asking pronouns are mostly people that have never been 
is gendered, right? So, I mean, I think it's just, in, but they still have pronouns. And so I do think it'll, it's going to be a very, very mainstream. And we always recommend that any intake or any first interaction or um, initial contact with young person, that you're sharing yours, even if they choose not to, which some people might, even after you explain it, they might have that kind of resistance. But even if they choose not to, you know, you respect that, then they know, they know what to expect from you. You know, they know that other people's pronouns will be respected by you, that you'll correct other people if they're using wrong pronouns, that, you know, they can, that this is a space where this part of your identity is respected. Cool. Good to move on. Yeah. Um, so because trans young people are experiencing housing instability and homelessness for longer periods of time more frequently, and then also have, um, you know, more challenging outcomes when it comes to our systems, it's really important to make sure that their use specifically are something that are considered and uh, work to ensuring that they're being met, right? Um, so I have eight considerations for working with trans young people. Um, again, cisgenderism, I think we can't that much home. Um, this is something that we hear a lot too. We don't have any transgender folks here. You just, you don't know. You have no idea. So it's always best to be operating with the idea that you do and you're not aware of it. Um, and be aware that if you're operating with the idea that you don't have any trans people within your program, then they probably don't feel like it's a safe place for them to exist authentically. Um, so when you're putting out a message there that you're, uh, you know, considering them in all aspects of programming and that they value, their value and that they matter, um, you're much more likely to then be able to support young people as they maybe question or explore different gender presentations or their identities as well. So one of the top considerations for working with trans young people and trans people in general is that um, there's, within the US, there's no like national federally mandated non-discrimination policy when it comes down to their identities. Um, this is something that within the U.S. at least that we see varies state to state, and that can also mean that their access to shelters can vary state to state based on how they present, what's on their ID, um, anything like that. How are they going to be housed? Um, it really varies based on the type of program, where it's located, um, and what sort of like identification that they have. Um, so if I'm not sure how it works here, but um, within you know, whatever communities you live in, uh, cities that you live in, um, it's really important to be, to know those legalities in and out, um, to know where the loopholes are, to know how and uh, in, in what ways you can make sure that you're accommodating um, someone's need to, you know, be housed in a way that feels safe to them. Um, so if, if you live in an area in which you can house people based on their gender identity uh, rather than their sex, that's phenomenal. Um, but we also always want to remind people that just because someone's gender identity might be A, they might not want to be housed with A. That might not feel safe. So um, you want to make sure that their input, feedback, as well as first priority choice is always on their knee. Um, the second thing that's really important is to validate chosen family. So a lot of queer people that don't have good relationships with their family, a lot of queer people that do have good relationships with their family build their own family units and family structures outside of traditional family norms. Um, this is something that is true of queer people across the world. You know, it's just one of those things, um, you know, and I found that when queer people say, oh, my mother, but they're not talking about their biological mother or my brother or my cousin, whatever like language that they're using for that relationship. If it's not biological, people don't really consider it to be valid. But it's really important that we're validating these relationships and honor them as the important relationships and the familial relationships that they are. These are like life or death, death family structures that are really important. The next thing is that sometimes, often, maybe, never, sometimes, people's identification will not match their presentation, it will not match 
their uh, gender marker. Um, someone can come in and not have that access to be able to change the gender marker on their ID, for example. Um, and when that does happen, just accept the information as it is and don't challenge, this isn't you, or this doesn't look like you, or you know whatever it is, and just understand that people's presentation in person versus their presentation on a government-issued ID might be very different. It's a matter of safety. Um, when you're, if you're flying or if you're going through security or whatever it is, sometimes people would prefer to have um, a presentation that it feels safer for them on their ID. Sometimes they don't have access to be able to change the marker. We don't know. We don't know the reason, but in general, when someone's ID does not match their presentation, accept that information as it is. <laughs> Trans people, queer people in general, um, often do not have the access to competent medical care that they desperately deserve and need. Um, if we're working with young people experiencing housing instability or homelessness, and you're partnered with a local medical professional, a doctor, whoever it is, um, it's really important in your responsibility to make sure that that person is competent about uh, trans identities, LGBTIQ identities, and that they're not walking into a space that's going to be further traumatizing. Um, a lot of queer people would rather forego the doctor altogether. Um, some trans people would rather get hormones on the street rather than go and be absolutely traumatized in the medical office. Um, if you're able to find someone that is competent, that's amazing. If you're not, I would say either accompany the young person to that appointment or have a meeting with that provider before the young person um, is there to make sure that they're aware of how to work properly with this community. I don't mean saying, here's all the information about the young person. I mean, like, we'd love to partner with you. We'd love to, you know, send referrals here, but we need to know that um, you're able to meet the needs of our clients. And so maybe offering some sort of like light training or something um, would be important. In terms of gender affirming care products, we're talking about makeup, wigs, binders, um, and you know anything, anything you think of that would affirm someone's gender presentation. Sometimes when young people are accessing shelters or services, um, they receive some sort of bag of toiletries, um, tampons, or what have you that accompanies them. Um, something to consider is you might not know which bag person would prefer. And so leaving it, leaving the option open or not having gendered bags at all um, is something to consider. In terms of like restrooms, not only putting tampons in the women's room, but putting them in both because not everybody that uses tampons identifies as a woman. Um, these are like, I would say, small and gigantic ways to be validating and supportive. We always try to use gender neutral language in like in the US we say guys a lot. Um, and so or like ladies and gentlemen. I'm sure there's like equivalents of that in most languages. Um, so when addressing like a large group of people or all of young people within a space or your colleagues even, um, we always recommend to try to use the most gender neutral language that you could possibly use. Um, ladies and gentlemen makes my skin crawl. It like it, kills me and automatically I'm like this person's ignorant like it just me my brain immediately goes there because I'm like anyone who is like down in the movement would not use that language and so it becomes this like absolute alarm signal for me that they anything they're about to say I'll take the grain of salt um so language is a really powerful tool to be able to ensure people are seen and validated um and so shy away, I would shy away from anything that's in that vein. In terms of facilities, so we kind of got into this a little bit at the institutional level. Um, any access to like locker rooms or showers or bathrooms, what have you, um, we always recommend equal access to these facilities. Sometimes that's not possible for whatever reason. So um, if a young person is saying, I don't feel safe using the men's room. Um, 
we need to find another alternative for them. Um, if you have multiple restrooms or a, a handicapped stall, a single use family stall, uh, we always recommend putting up an all gender restroom sign and allowing people to use that private space on their own and not have to be within the space with everyone else if they don't feel comfortable. I think in general, most people prefer a single stall, so um, always recommend that anyways. But if there's not that option there, and if you don't have these opportunities for separate facilities that have equal access because of any sort of like laws or regulations, um, finding some sort of workaround is really important. So um, if that means like uh, finding time that this person can have their access to a bathroom that makes them feel safe, or a shower that makes them feel safe, locker room, whatever it is, it's your responsibility to find that time. And not say, sorry, you just have to use this one that makes you feel terrible. If you work in a facility or space or anything that has security staff, these are the people you want to make sure are trained on how to work with LGBTIQ young people. Um, security can be a really traumatizing place. You know, any sort of like pat down or the ID moment, if your ID doesn't match your identity or your presentation, sorry. Um, these moments can be really like triggering, traumatizing, scary, even violent. People feel, some people feel really betrayed and angry um, if they are confused by someone's gender. And that can be unsafe for young people. If there are security staff or any sort of like front door staff that are um, making young people feel unsafe when they first walk in, pretty much nothing that you do as an organization will help mitigate that because they'll always walk in and have that feeling of um, disrespect and unsafe uh, environment. Pronouns, we're all pros by now, I would say. Um, so asking pronouns is, again, a great way to validate somebody, a great way to um, you know, make sure that you're being inclusive of everyone. Um, it is going to be the most mainstream thing in the world soon, so let's get ahead of the curve here. Um, and then we also have the general awareness of your duration of homelessness. So we know, everyone in this room knows that trans young people are going to experience housing instability for longer periods of time. And that's really, really important to know because it doesn't actually have to be that way. They don't need to experience housing instability for longer periods of time. They don't need to experience it more frequently. If we're setting up our systems and our programs um, with their needs in mind, we can help to lower that number and bring it down and make sure that if they're feeling safe and supported, they're going to be able to end up in more stable outcomes. Any questions on the considerations? We're fine. What? How much time do I have? Oh, I'm just five, sorry. Okay, cool. That's okay. <laughs> Perfect. Um, Great. So these are finally um, six criteria that we developed alongside young people, service providers, our team, um, that are great considerations for setting up your space in a way that is as affirming and inclusive for all young people, of course, LGBTQ people in mind. Um, the physical space is one of the first ways to project a message of inclusivity and, um, you know, of, of affirming people's identities when they first walk in. When it comes to, like, safe space stickers and things like that, I'm always like, it's, it's the least that you can do, you know, literally. But also, it's the least you can do just put up a little sticker. Um, you want to make sure that a sticker that says this is a safe space can be validated by the space that's behind it, right? Um, so it's not enough to put up a sticker, but it's a great place to start. You really want to invest in the rest of the criteria, including like staff training, <laughs> um, you know, making sure your intake process, everything like that is backing up what you're projecting. Um, but I will tell you, the second a young person walks in and sees a sticker like that, there's a level of maybe even grain of trust that starts to develop. Um, if you have the sticker on your clipboard or something like that, 
they'll identify you as a person that they could maybe come to in the future if they have any problem or need that's specific to their identity. Um, it's just a great way to signal what you're all about and uh, people notice it. Similarly, uh, all gender restrooms, if, they're, if you're able to provide them, I think it's always the preferred way to go. Um, give people that privacy and access so they don't have to wonder um, or stress or anything like that or hold your pee all day. Or, you know, you want to make sure people are able to go safely to the restroom. I think that's like a, a very basic human right. And then in terms of like posters that you have up or any sort of like signage, things like that. Um, ideally, it's cool, okay? You want to make sure it's cool signs. But if you don't have the money for that, that's fine too. And uh, I would say having posters or uh, toolkits or anything like that in which people can see themselves reflected in um, so the images within them are not just, you know, really cis, uh, straight-looking kids playing in a field or something. I mean, you want visibly queer people. You want people of color. You want people to see themselves reflected in any materials that you have, because that also is just a really uh, nice and easy way to say that we, at the very least, see that you exist. For programming, we have a million ideas, but here's just a couple. If you have catered programming for uh, LGBTIQ young people, that is awesome. If you do not, you can, you know, it's that simple. So we recommend things like queer movie nights. You know, there's a lot of great movies out there. They don't all have to be really sad, horrible movies where someone dies or, you know, there are really good ones out there if you need recommendations from directly to me. Um, we always recommend movie rights trainings. Uh, queer people are much more heavily targeted by police and police in general. Um, and so any sort of know your rights training for dealing with um, authorities or police is a great thing to keep in mind. Um, any sort of like LGBTQ, LGBTIQ specific like discussion groups. Um, sometimes I'll be talking to a service provider, they'll be like, we tried that for two weeks, but no one ever showed up. Like, okay, well, they probably were like feeling it out a little bit and to pull the plug after two weeks, I don't think it's fair. So I would say you want to keep these things on the calendar, have like some sort of like drop-in space or office hours, whatever it is, um, someone will show up. Someone will eventually show up. Um, I would also say like these kind of programs don't need to be developed by adults, you know? That can be developed by young people that are accessing the programs and services, um, asking them directly, what would you like for us to have? You know, like, what sort of discussion group would you be interested in or anything like that? It's always smart. Would you like to lead it and not have, like, a, a you know, psychotherapist leading every single session? I think it's a great way to make it more accessible and fun, probably. No offense to psychotherapists, I'm a social person. Um, also, if you're offering any sort of like sexual health workshops, um, understanding that um, not all sex is the same um, and not all sex is heterosex. So just having people who are informed um, about different identities and different um, sexual identities, things like that could be really important. Number three are your policies. So if your organizational policies are not clearly outlined, and you're more of a, you just go based on you know, feel and practice, um, your practice doesn't exist in my mind. So if it's not backed up by written policies, it might as well not be occurring, because if tomorrow your entire staff is turned over, we have a whole new slew of people in here, um, we can't guarantee that they're going to be operating the same way that you are. You might be you know, the best person on staff for this, this and this, you might have to leave that job. We want to make sure that whatever you're doing that's really supportive and inclusive continues. The best way to do that is to formalize it into policy. So some sort of policies that you want to consider are non-discrimination policies, very broadly, you know, um, ensuring that everyone that enters a space has a right to present authentically, that can come into like clothing and appearance. Um, some people wouldn't expect that to be an important policy, to say that people can dress authentically within this space and outside of this space also. Um, to be a formal policy is incredibly important. I've definitely heard people say they can dress however they want in here, 
But when they go out on the street, we prefer that they dress in you know more binary clothing. Um, it's not a good idea. It's very dehumanizing. Um, you, you cannot protect people. That much. That's very paternalistic. You cannot protect people like 24 hours a day. There's a real wide world out there. Um, so that kind of policy causes more harm than good. But having a policy on the books that supports the right to present authentically, great idea. Um, in terms of referrals, having a policy around who you're referring to and what sort of requirements um, are associated with that referral agency or organization are, are, are important. Um, you know, are you referring to people that you've never met, you've never visited the space, you don't know anything about their intake process, you don't know, you just Google, um, you know, hair salon, and then send someone somewhere, and then they get absolutely traumatized by whoever's working there. I mean, make sure that you know exactly where you're sending someone, have a policy around it. In terms of like housing and facilities, is there a policy about access to bathrooms? Is there a policy around how we uh, assign housing? Um, is there a policy about young know, people's uh, right and autonomy to be able to choose these things? Um, put it on the books. Staff training, super important. So you can have all this stuff in the world, all the stickers and policies and bathrooms and whatever else in the world, but if your staff are not trained, it, it doesn't matter. You know, um, this is like a house of cards. You know, we really want to make sure that every single level of this is really, really strong in staff training. That's our day to day interaction, baby. That is so important. Um, so, either we're doing staff training on an annual basis, we're doing staff training as soon as they're hired, we are opening up our you know, um, application process for a new job, including the fact that we are supporting a firm in place for LGBTIQ young people. We're asking questions in their interview about that. We're making sure people are aware when they sign up for this job what's expected of them in terms of supporting LGBTIQ young people. This is incredibly important. And then we're training them to back up and training them to make sure that they understand the way that we do things and the way that we support these young people. Intake forms. Uh, so there's a million different ways you can set these up. There's a million different questions that are required um, by wherever you are in the world. I know what ours are, for example, we have to include legal name. Um, we have to, okay. Um, but that doesn't mean you can't add more questions. So you might not be allowed to take any questions away, um, but you can be in control of what questions you add and how you ask the questions that you were asking. So this intake form uh, is a sample from one of the organizations that we work with, that they gave us. Um, so they have first name and last name, which is, again, required. But right underneath it, they have preferred name if applicable. The way that I would ask that question to get to understand their legal name as well as the name they go by is I would say, what name would you like me to call you? That's, you put that under preferred name, and then you can say, and what's the name on your ID? Or what's your legal name, however you want to phrase it. And then you can get to their legal name. Um, I think opening up any sort of intake process, acknowledging that these are some of these are questions that you have to ask for whatever reason, maintaining full transparency of why you're asking it, where the data is going, where the information is going, so it's not just, okay, why am I giving you all of this for what? Um, I think anybody would feel much better to know where the deeply personal information is going. Um, in terms of their gender, we have on the right, how do you identify your gender? And we have a list. Um, I actually recommend a line uh, rather than a list, like more of a fill in the blank, um, maybe with some examples of different genders. Uh, but you can you can do whatever feels right and natural to you. Because uh, again, some people won't really have an understanding of what that question is even asking, and it's okay to explain it to them. Um, bottom left, to identify as LGBTQ, yes, no, they don't know, or they refused. And then finally, which pronouns would you like for me to use? I think what's also important here is that not all these questions necessarily need to be asked the first time you meet somebody, right? Um, and they don't need to be asked verbally, and they don't need to be asked in any sort of specific, specific way if they're not the questions that you need to collect in order to like literally admit somebody 
to your program. If someone comes in and they're like, I'm doing my laundry, and you're like, tell me your trauma history, I would probably reassess why you're doing that, right? Um, but I would say some important questions to ask people on that initial meeting would definitely be the pronouns that they use, if they want to share them, the name that they go by, if they want to share that. Um, and then in terms of like where they would like to be housed, if it's like sex segregated or whatever, you would need to know in order to safely house them. And, but you can work with them on that. We're not robots here. Um, Jema, who we work with at True Colors, that wasn't able to come, recently finished a research report uh, surveying young people on what they want to be asked, what they don't want to be asked, when they want to be asked, when they don't, and how. So that, do they want to be asked verbally? Do they want to fill out the paperwork themselves? Do they want to, you know, do kind of like a hybrid? Um, I don't have the data included in here. I think it's out. Do you know if that's out? That report? Not yet. Yeah, so maybe it's not out yet. Um, but once it is, definitely share it with y'all. Um, I think it's really helpful because these, these are the, like, you know, they're important questions to ask, but they're not all weighted the exact same in terms of like need to know basis. Um, I don't need to know someone's complete like sexual identity in order to safely house them. Um, another area that we find to be super important to understand what's going on at an organization and whether or not it's affirming, whether or not it's inclusive as possible, is to get that feedback directly from young people and get that feedback directly from staff. So asking staff, do you feel comfortable asking the young person their pronouns? Do you feel comfortable asking someone about their sexual identity or their gender identity or expression? Um, what would make you feel more comfortable? Asking questions like that is, I think, the best way to know the answer to those questions. I mean, you could also gather that information based on client feedback. So if clients are saying, they're asking me in the most awkward way possible, or I hear them constantly misgender so and so, or um, they never correct anybody when they misgender me, or whatever it is. You're going to get that feedback one way or another, either from young people or from staff. But it's really helpful in order to be able to better serve young people to know where those gaps lie and also know what are the best ways to you know support staff in getting to that next level of knowledge. Um, so this example is, you know, the majority of staff felt confident or very confident supporting clients questioning their sexual orientation. Um, we've done surveys like this across the United States with different organizations. I would say very rarely do people feel super confident about that. So it's, but it's something that comes up. It's something that young people might need support on. And so we want to make sure that staff are prepared when that moment arises. Yeah. Does anyone have any questions for Coco? I was thinking of put on the form when you showed us because in Portugal where I'm from. Uh, so I worked in uh, yeah, so I worked in HR and I always ask people what is their gender on like this kind of finance form. Mm -hmm. But then our lawyer was like, this is illegal. <laughs> you have to ask oh wait, thank you. You have to ask for their sex. And I'm like, they're not gonna ask them. They're like, yeah. So how do you respond to that? And maybe you have a language uh, suggestion that I don't know. <laughs> I do have a language suggestion that maybe you don't know. I don't know. Um, yes, so really good point. So this paperwork does not include sex. That is typically something that, um, this is just a snapshot. It's like much, much longer in take form. Um, but that is something that is always asked, I would say, at an intake. Um, so we usually recommend um, if you legally have to ask someone sex, you can ask them like what's listed on their ID, for example. So like, what's the gender marker on your ID? Or how's your sex listed on your ID? Um, or what was your sex assigned at birth? But that's a little bit like clinical. Yeah, so you can say gender marker on ID, which is, yeah, I would say we, uh, we do say gender marker on ID, but a lot of people in the US don't really know the difference between sex and gender. So we might, but maybe some of the uh, young people that are coming in aren't like, well, that's not what gender means, you know? Well, I might, but like, I think saying, what's the gender marker on your ID? And then you can say, is it an F, an M, an I, whatever. And then giving like the same um, kind of like examples could be a way. And then also asking your gender. Okay. So that way you can um, capture both. Yeah, no problem. 
since you're quite uh, used to, you know, like in between like this and so on. I was just wondering, like, what are the, I don't know, the biggest misconceptions people have, or I don't know, like things that you find that, like repeating constantly, like concept, concept that the people are struggling with? That's a really good question. I think a lot of people struggle, honestly, with like having to be like sex and gender, and also like the understanding that like being transgender does not mean that you're gay. You know, like think like kind of like simple things like that that they would, or to me something very simple like that and basic like that. That like yeah, your gender is different than your sexual orientation, right? So um, sometimes like hammering home those kind of things. Um, I think in general, too, people really do struggle with pronouns. So in the US, we use uh, they, them pronouns a lot. Both non binary people use that uh, pronoun a lot. Um, and a lot of people struggle with using it conversationally because it's a pronoun that we typically use for large groups. So a lot of people are like, that's not grammatically correct. But it, first of all, it is. Um, and second of all, it just takes like, a little bit of practice. We use it all the time. You know, conversationally, but not, might not realize it. Um, and I always recommend that people practice it. My mother has been practicing it a lot, which is really sweet. And she's like, she's like this close. My friend was coming to pick me up once, and um, we use they them pronouns, and she was like, she was like, okay, I'm gonna try it. Is they coming inside? And I was like, oh man. So I was like, just use it, just use it like you speak English. <laughs> like you speak English. Are they coming inside? She's like, I got it. Is they driving? You know, like, you know, but it's just like it's that effort that's like really, really nice. I think people are afraid of looking dumb or making a mistake and hurting someone or whatever it is, and it's like no one is mad about that. You know, like that doesn't make anyone angry. Um, it's just the effort is really, really kind. So I would say that's a big one. People struggle with um, really like acknowledging the ways that oppression show up in our systems. I think people feel really defensive about it, um, and like, well, that's not my fault. I didn't say it was right. Like, so all of all of this was done without our consent. All of you know, every form of oppression was not crafted by the people in this room, um, but we all live within it, and we all uh, have power to either shut it down or perpetuate it, depending on what we want to do. I recommend shutting it down. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, you know what? Um, that's my email address on that last slide. Feel free to reach out, Coco, at truecolorsunited.org. Um, we have a ton of resources, toolkits, uh, like actual online courses. Everything's free, available for download. We have these toolboxes that are really cool and nice and have beautiful um, you know, posters and buttons and all sorts of stuff in them, too. Um, I think you can order those materials, or you can download the, like, Files to print out on your app for free uh, if you want. So I recommend you check it out. Thank you all. Appreciate it.